morning. And let's begin today's session. So last class session, we discussed calculating the expected yield based on our limiting reactant and using our identified limiting reactant to calculate the mass of excess reactant remaining. So in this case, we're given in the problem that we have 50 grams of sodium bromide and 100 grams of silver nitrate that are mixed to yield silver bromide and sodium nitrate. Now, the first thing that we need to do is we need to develop a chemical equation. So critically for the chemical equation, we need to know the formulas. So sodium bromide is NaBr. Okay, we cross our charges and that gives us a one-to-one -one ratio of sodium to bromine. So we wrote out the formula for sodium bromide. For silver nitrate, we have silver plus and nitrate, which is NO3 minus. We cross our charges and that gives us AgNO3. Likewise, silver bromide follows the same logic. We cross our charges, that gives us AgBr. And for sodium nitrate, just to showcase the complete logic, we have sodium plus, we have nitrate, which is NO3 minus. We cross our charges, and that gives us NaNO3. Okay, so now that we have all of our formulas written out, we can write out our preliminary unbalanced chemical equation. So it's always important that you first get your formulas completely written out before you try to balance your equation. If your formulas aren't correct, then you'll be stuck when you try to balance the equation. So now that we have this equation in place, my question to all of you is, is this equation balanced? It does this equation have the same number of atoms on each element on each side of the reaction equation? Is this equation balanced? Yes. Perfect, okay, so we'll put a check mark there. Now, here's an important strategic idea. If we're asked to calculate the mass of precipitate product and to determine the mass of excess reactant, if we need to know both the amount of product that we make and the amount of reactant left over, what method would be useful? What method should we use? What method is, is most applicable in this case? The ICE method or the product method? If we need to calculate both the amount of product generated and the amount of excess reactant, which method works best for that kind of calculation? Product. Uh, so the ICE method, it would allow you to simultaneously calculate both of these quantities but I can showcase both the ICE method and the product method. So in both methods, we're gonna need to figure out the moles of each of our reactants. So we know that the moles are obtained by dividing the mass by the molar mass. So in one mole of sodium bromide, we know that if we add up our masses, we have 23.0 grams for sodium and let's look up in our periodic table just to be sure for our molar masses. So if we break out our periodic table. 79.9. Perfect. That's the molar mass of bromine, okay? So if we punch that into our calculator, if we punch that into our calculator, so we have 23 plus 79.9, that's 102.9. So if we have 50 divided by 102.9, that gives us 0 0.4859 
And I'm just going to note that we only have one significant figure in this case because our input has one sig fig. So this gives us the moles of sodium bromide. We're going to need that for later. Let's also calculate the moles of silver nitrate. So we have 100 grams of silver nitrate. And in one mole of silver nitrate, would someone be able to tell me the molar mass of silver? If we look at 107.9 gram per mole, that's exactly right. Perfect, perfect. OK. Now we just have to account for nitrogen, which is 14.0 gram per mole. Oxygen is 16 gram per mole times three oxygen atoms. OK, so showcasing our calculation for the molar mass, we have 107.9 plus 14 plus 16 times 3, which gives us 169.9. If we divide 100 by 169.9, we get 0 0.5886 moles of silver nitrate. OK. Now, we certainly can process this using the product method. But if we need to do this kind of simultaneous calculation, if we need to do this kind of simultaneous calculation, we're going to need we're going to need to likely have to use an ice method. So we're going to write out our sodium bromide and our silver nitrate. And we're going to make just a makeshift ice table. So in our initial column for sodium bromide, we just put the initial moles of sodium bromide. For silver nitrate, we put the initial moles of silver nitrate. OK, what will our change coefficient be? If each of our reaction coefficients are 1, what will our minus change? Minus 1x. Yes, it would be minus 1x. OK, well, for our products, they'll be plus x, and we have 0 products to start out with. OK, so now that we have this set up, we can solve for x. Remember the shortcut that I taught you last class session? We know that x is equal to the moles of your reactant over the reaction coefficient. So we're going to solve for x for sodium bromide, and we're going to solve for x for silver nitrate. And remember, when we talked about this previously, the smallest value of x, the smallest value of x tells us our limiting reactant. And yes, the reactant side will always have a negative change coefficient because intuitively we know that when a reaction proceeds, we use up our reactant. So we're losing reactant and we're making product. Does that answer your question? Does that, does that make sense? Does the logic behind the signs make sense? Perfect. So now, a reaction can only proceed as long as we have reactant to consume. So the smaller value of x, the smaller value of x indicates our limiting reactant. So which reactant is limiting? Which reactant do we completely use up at the end of our reaction? Sodium bromide. Yep, so we see sodium bromide has the smaller value of x. So sodium bromide is limiting. So as a result, what we're going to do is we're going to take the value of x that we've so carefully calculated, and we're going to plug it in. So then we're just going to plug in this value of x, so 0 0.4859. So we use up all of our sodium bromide.
And so at the end of this calculation, we've simultaneously figured out the ending amount of product, how many moles of product we make, but not only that, but by subtracting the initial from the change, we've also been able to figure out that we have 0 0.1027 moles of silver nitrate remaining. So in effect, we've answered the two questions that we need to address in this problem. How much product do we make and how much reactant is left over? Does that make sense to everyone? Does this process make sense? Yes. So the main reason why I'm using the ICE method is because I need to calculate both. The way that you determine X, just as a refresher, you take the moles of each reactant and you divide by the coefficient. So moles over the coefficient for that reactant. And since both of our coefficients are one, we divide the moles of each reactant by one. Does that make sense? Professor, could you explain the E part one more time? Ah, e for is the ending, for the reactant. Yeah, E is the ending amount. So whatever amount we start start out with, accounting for how much change occurs in the reaction, E is the ending amount of material. So for each of our reactants, we lose our a certain amount of reactant based on the coefficient and the change X. For our limiting reactant, such as sodium bromide, we use up all of our sodium bromide because it's limiting. For silver nitrate, we use up a large amount of our silver nitrate based on our stoichiometry, and a little bit of our silver nitrate is left over. For silver bromide as a product, we make product based on the reaction stoichiometry and our change coefficient x. And as we see, as the reaction proceeds, we generate more product. Does that make sense? Yes. Perfect. Professor, so basically on the E section, we um, subtract. And then on the, on the positive side, we add. And that's how we get the two circled numbers, correct? Exactly right. And so from this, we're able to conclude we have 0 0.1027 moles of silver nitrate in excess and silver bromide, we made 0 0.4859 moles. So this method tells us how much product we made and how much reactant we have left over. And the best part about this method is it's scalable. It can, no matter how many different species you have in your reaction, the ice table can calculate them all simultaneously. Does this process make sense? And the best part is we're, all we have to do at the end is convert to grams. Exactly right. So we have the moles. If we want to know the mass of product generated and the mass of reactant remaining, we can do just that. So if we want to know the mass of product, we're going to take the moles of silver bromide and convert it to the grams of silver bromide. And we know how to do a mass to mole conversion. We've done that plenty of times in this class. I'm going to need some students to help me out here. Uh, we know that the mass of silver is 107.9 grams and bromine is 79.9 grams. So if we add these up, we have the molar mass of silver bromide. So as we see the moles of silver bromide cancels and we're left with grams of silver bromide. So punching this into our calculator, so we have 107.9 plus 79.9 times 0 0.4859. And that gives us 44.11 grams that we round to 40 grams of silver bromide, just because our inputs only had one sig fig. 
Does that make sense? So we have the massive product that we've made. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Perfect. And now to figure out the mass of reactant left over. So the mass of reactant left, we're gonna go from the moles of silver nitrate to the grams of silver nitrate. So we'll have 0 0.1027, reading off from our ice table, that's the moles of silver nitrate left over. And we know silver has a mass of 107.9, nitrogen has a mass of 14, oxygen has a mass of 16, and we have three oxygens. So this is the molar mass of silver nitrate. So if we punch this into our calculator, if we punch this into our calculator, we have 107.9 plus 14 plus 16 times three. So we get 169.9 times 0 0.1027. And that gives us a final mass of 17.4 grams of silver nitrate that we round to our one sig fig of 20 grams of silver nitrate. Does this method make a little bit more sense? Does everyone see why the ICE method is preferred in this case and this case only? Because we need both the amount of reactant left over and the amount of product generated. Professor, I have a question. So if you had 17.4, you said um, rounding that off, why do you get 20? Ah, because if we look at each of our, if we look at each of our inputs, if we look at each of our, oops, one moment. Okay, so if we look at, if we look at, oops, one moment. So let me pan up so that way we can see where we're discussing. So if we look at our initial inputs, notice for 50 grams and 100 grams, how many significant figures do they have? Uh, how many significant digits do we have in 50 and 100? Would, would the class like to chime in on this? How many sig figs do 50 and 100 have as written right now? One. One. And because they have one significant figure, as we're doing a series of multiplication operations, we're ultimately going to be left with a final answer that should only be reported to one significant figure. Does that logic make sense? Yes. Perfect. Any other questions on this example? Any other questions on this example? I have a question. Yes, please go ahead. On the E part, you know how you got um, 0.1? 027. How'd you get that? The number right here? Yes. So wait, no, 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 sorry. The one above. The 0 0.4859? No, no, no. More higher. On the ice part, you know how you're doing the math there? I don't get it. Ah, okay. So let's talk about this. One moment. Let me pan up so that way we can discuss. Okay. So Okay, so the way the ice table works is first we filled in our initial moles. So we know we initially have these amounts of silver bromide and, oh, sorry, of sodium bromide and silver nitrate. Mm -hmm. now, as the reaction proceeds, it's going to undergo a change and we're going to lose reactant based on the reaction coefficient and the change coefficient. We figured out the change coefficient by taking 
the moles that we started out with for each of our reactants divided by the coefficient, which is one. The smaller value of X indicates our limiting reactant and in turn tells us how far the reaction proceeds. So sodium bromide is limiting and we're gonna plug in this value of X into our ice expression for each of our change coefficients. Then we in turn add our initial and change columns together. And we see that when we add up the initial and change column for sodium bromide, we're left with zero moles of sodium bromide. For silver nitrate, we start with this amount of silver nitrate. And after our reaction proceeds, we lose the nitrate and we're left with 0 0.1027. In other words, so our moles of silver nitrate left is equal to the initial minus the change, which is 0 0.5886 moles of silver nitrate minus 0 0.4859 moles of silver nitrate consumed and we're left with 0 0.1027. Does okay, yeah, thank you. Perfect, no problem, no problem at all. Professor, I still, um, my answer, I feel like my answer wasn't, my question was not answered in regards to the one sig fig. I get that part why we look at the one sig fig, but yeah. um, wouldn't that be, if it's 17.4, wouldn't that be, um, um, so would that be 18? So if we look, if we look to the right, if we only have one sig fig. Oh, I get it now. Okay. okay. Yeah, that would be two. So if we look to the right, that tells us we have to round up. And so our final answer would have a two in the tens place. So it'd have one sig fig and it would be rounded up to 20. Yeah, I was looking at the four. Sorry. Okay, no problem. No problem at all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So let's look at another example. This is pretty similar to what you may see on an exam. And this is also really important if you want to sort of be prepared for future sections when we talk about titration and um, using a chemical reaction to calculate the amount of another species in that reaction mixture. Okay. So we're considering a reaction between calcium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid to yield calcium chloride and water. When one gram, one times 10 to the second, so 100 grams of each reactant is combined, we're asked, what is the limiting reactant? How much water is produced? And how much excess reactant do we have left over? So, before we even attempt to start doing mass to mole conversions, what's the first thing that we need? What's the first thing that we need from this statement? Writing down the equation. Yes, exactly right. So we need our formulas and the equation. So now that we have that problem solving map set up. Let's work on writing out the formulas for each of these chemical species. And let's try to write out our proposed unbalanced and balanced chemical equation. So let's take about two to three minutes and let's try to write out the balanced equation using the annotate feature, or you can type your proposed balanced equation in the chat. So let's try to write out the formulas for each of these chemical compounds and let's try to write a preliminary balanced equation.
So looking at so looking at the chat, we see one of your classmates has proposed the following tentative unbalanced equation. So let me just convey what they've presented for our class to discuss. What does everyone think of these formulas proposed? Do you agree with the formulas proposed? Do you disagree with the formulas proposed? Do you have a different set of formulas? And then looking at this chemical equation, if you agree with the way this chemical equation was set up, I'd like you to then start trying to balance this equation by adding some reaction coefficients. So we have a preliminary skeletal unbalanced equation. And let's now try to balance this equation by adjusting our reaction coefficients. And let's try to get a few pieces of feedback in the chat so that way we can have a pretty robust discussion. So we have the proposed coefficients of one, two, one, and two. What does everyone think for this proposed balanced equation? Do you agree with this balanced equation? Do you disagree with this balanced equation? Let's try to get some responses in the chat and then we'll break down the logic behind how we balance this equation. Okay, so first let's talk about the formulas. So calcium hydroxide, calcium typically adopts a two plus charge. Hydroxide has a minus one charge. We cross our charges, that gives us CaOH2. Hydrochloric acid, so it's derived from H plus and chloride, which is Cl minus, and that gives us the formula of HCl. Calcium chloride is calcium two plus and Cl minus. We cross our charges and that gives us CaCl2. So that's how we reached our skeletal equation. Now counting our atoms, we see that we'd have one calcium, two oxygen and two hydrogen. And we'd have, if before balancing preliminarily, we'd have one hydrogen and one chloride on the left well, we have one calcium and two chloride on the right. So to fix this, we use a coefficient of two to give us two hydrogens and two chlorides. So now that we have a total of four hydrogens on the left, if we initially have two hydrogens and one oxygen from water, we need a coefficient of two to give us four hydrogens and two oxygens. Does it make sense how we've reached this balanced chemical equation? Does everyone understand how we've written out and balanced this chemical equation? So now that we have this balanced chemical equation, I'd like the class to try to address the first two questions. Keeping in mind, you're gonna to need to answer all three over the course of this problem solving session. So first we have to identify the limiting reactant, and then we have to identify the mass of water produced from this reaction. So let's try to work through this example. You may wanna use the product method or the ice table method. And Let's give students about five minutes to work through this example, and then we'll provide and we'll have a broader class discussion once we've shared some responses in the chat or verbally. You can also share the equations or work process that you use to reach your final answer, as that would be invaluable in getting a sense of how the class tackles these problems and allows me to provide feedback into your problem solving process. 
So let's, now that we have the balanced equation and now that we have the mass of each reactant given in the problem, let's try to calculate our expected yield for this reaction. And if you have any questions, don't be shy to ask. And if you have any questions, don't be shy to ask. And we'll discuss this example in about four minutes. And let's try to see some proposals for what species is our limiting reactant and what mass of water are we making from this reaction. This is very similar to a question that you would see on an exam or quiz. And so I want students to have the opportunity to work through these questions, engage with these questions, and share their responses with the broader class. One place that you may want to start, one place that may be very reasonable to start is to figure out how many moles of each reactant we're starting out with. So how many moles of calcium hydroxide do we have and how many moles of hydrochloric acid are we starting out with? So we have some students proposing already in the chat that calcium hydroxide is limiting, okay? Let's try, let's try to see some additional comments that provide a little bit of the logic or work substan substantiating that claim. And that way we can get a sense of the process behind identifying the limiting reactant. And we can get a sense of the, the potential yield of product that we're making from this reaction. So let's keep working through this example and don't be shy to share your predicted yield or limiting reactant assignment in the chat or verbally. Or if you have a question, don't be shy to ask a question in, in the chat or verbally and I'd be happy to answer it. And we'll discuss this example in about another two to three minutes. And we have a proposal in the chat that we that this reaction would yield roughly 48.5 grams of water. 
Let's try to get a few more responses in the chat and we'll discuss momentarily. Or if students need more time as they're working through this example, don't be shy to let me know. Let's keep working through this example. Don't be shy to keep asking questions or submitting your proposals in the chat and we'll discuss in about two minutes. And let's try to get a few more student proposals in the chat for this problem as we work through. You can also share any work that you've done as your intermediate steps, such as the moles of calcium hydroxide or the moles of hydrochloric acid. Um, all of these intermediate steps are important. Um, and it's great to see in the chat, we even have a proposal for the mass of excess reactant that is left over. Perfect, perfect. So we'll take another minute to try to make as much progress as we can. Don't be shy to share your proposed responses in the chat or any questions you have in the chat. And we'll talk about this example together as a class in about another minute. Okay, so let's talk about this example. Given that we need to calculate both the amount of product generated and reactant left over, again, the ICE table method seems most appropriate. So for the moles of calcium hydroxide, so to calculate the moles of calcium hydroxide, we're gonna go from the grams of calcium hydroxide to the moles of calcium hydroxide. Okay, so then if we start with 1.00 times 10 to the second grams of calcium hydroxide, we know that in one mole of calcium hydroxide, our molar mass is 40 plus 16 times two plus one times two. Punching that into our calculator, punching that into our calculator. We have 40 plus 16 times two plus two. Okay, so we take our 100 grams over our molar mass of 74, and that gives us 1.35 moles of calcium hydroxide. Okay, let's repeat the same calculation. Let's re repeat the same process for, hy for hydrochloric acid. Okay, so let's repeat the same process for hydrochloric acid. So if we're trying to figure out the initial moles of hydrochloric acid, we take our mass of hydrochloric acid, which is 1.00 times 10 to the second grams of hydrochloric acid times one mole of hydrochloric acid over 35.45 plus 1.00 grams. So punching that into the calculator, we get 100 divided by 36, and that gives us 2.777 moles of hydrochloric acid.
just to be 100% accurate, if we carry out all of our sig figs, we get 2.743 moles of hydrochloric acid. Okay, now we're ready to set up our, our ice table. So I'm gonna write out each of our reactants, making sure to account for the coefficients. Okay. So we know that our initial moles are given. So we have 1.35 moles of calcium hydroxide. We have 2.743 moles of hydrochloric acid. We have zero moles of each of our products. And now this is really important. This is where you need to pay attention to stoichiometry. For our change, what is the coefficient for calcium hydroxide? Is it one, two, three? What is the coefficient for calcium hydroxide? What is the reaction coefficient for calcium hydroxide? One. One, one. yep. So our change would be minus one X. Comparatively for hydrochloric acid, what is the change coefficient? Minus two X. Yep, it would be two. So it would be written as minus two X. For calcium chloride, it would be plus X. And what about for water? Since it has a coefficient of two, it would, instead of being plus X, it would be plus two X. Two X, exactly. Okay, so now we know that we can calculate X. We can calculate our reaction progress for each of our two reactants. So let's showcase how we calculate X. So to calculate X, you take the moles of your reactant over your reaction coefficient. So for calcium hydroxide, we get a value of X of 1.35. Comparatively for hydrochloric acid, we get a value of X of 2.743 divided by two and this is where you need to be really careful with your, with your calculations and make sure you enter everything with precision into your calculator. So we have 2.743 over two, and that gives us 1.3715 for our value of X for hydrochloric acid. So then, which reactant is limiting? Which, which value of X do we actually use? Which value of X is smaller? Which reactant has the smaller value of X? Calcium hydroxide. Yep, exactly right. So we put a box around calcium hydroxide. Wait, are you able to go over how you got that X value? Yes, so to calculate X, you take your initial moles. Uh -huh which are right here, and you divide by your reaction coefficient. So for calcium hydroxide, the coefficient is one, so we divide by one. For hydrochloric acid, the coefficient is two, so we divide by two. Okay, thank Whichever you. Whichever number is smaller, that's your limiting reactant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So now that we've identified that calcium hydroxide is limiting, what we're going to do is we're just going to replace our value of x with our limiting reactant value of x. So we're going to plug in x into this ice table. So we plug in 1.35. And punching this into our calculator, at the end, we're going to add our initial and change columns together. So we use up all of our calcium hydroxide. We're completely using up our calcium hydroxide. For our hydrochloric acid, we're gonna take our initial minus our change. So we have 1.35 times two, and we're gonna subtract that from 2.743. And that gives us 0 0.043 moles of hydrochloric acid left over. For calcium chloride, zero plus 1.35 gives us 1.35 
moles of calcium chloride. And for water, two times 1.35 gives us 2.70 moles of water. Does this method make sense to everyone? Yeah. Perfect. So now that we have the moles, now that we have the moles, all we have to do is convert to grams. So let's do just that. So if we want to figure out the grams of water, we're going to go from the moles of water to the grams of water. So we have 2.70 moles of water times 18.0 grams per mole of water. And punching that into our calculator. So we have 2.70 times 18. And that in turn gives us 48.6 grams of water generated. Does that make sense to everyone? So once we have the moles from our ice table, all we're doing is a simple mole to mass conversion. Does this part make sense to everyone so far? Yeah. Perfect. So to calculate the grams of hydrochloric acid left over, Again, we're going to go from the moles of hydrochloric acid to the grams of hydrochloric acid. So if we have 0 0.043 moles of hydrochloric acid and our mass is 36.0 gram per mole of hydrochloric acid, if we punch this into our calculator, we get 0 0.043 times 36. And that gives us 1.55 grams of hydrochloric acid left over. So this is the type of process that I like to use for solving these limiting reactant problems where I need to know not only how much product am I making, but how much uh, excess reactant is remaining. Does this logic make sense to everyone? Does this process and does this problem make sense to everyone? Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So let's let's keep going now. This was, I just provided extra space. The nice thing about the ice table is, well, uh, what were the sig figs based on? So to go up all the way to our, so the sig figs in our final answer were based on our input. So notice how each of our inputs have three sig figs. So our final answer must have three sig figs. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Oops. Okay, so let's discuss and let's talk about the last major concept for this chapter. So there are a few additional examples in the notes that I'll, I'll leave for you to practice individually. Wait, sorry, Professor, for the number part three of that question, is it, I don't know, what's the answer? Is it both the 48.6 and the 1.55? So the 48.6 is the mass of water generated. So this is the mass of product generated. Uh -huh. While the 1.55 grams of hydrochloric acid is the amount of our excess reactant that is left over at the end of our reaction. Oh, 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 got it. I was thinking product. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Perfect. So in the note set, I, I provided a few additional examples if you, for you to work on independently. We're going to keep moving through this chapter. So we're going to keep going past the example on page 72. 
and pass the example on page 74. And we're gonna start to talk a little bit about a really foundational and important concept in terms of chemical reactions. So throughout this chapter, we've been calculating the expected or theoretical yield of product. But a really important principle is that when you run a chemical reaction in practice, you often do not recover all of the product from a chemical reaction. There are two reasons for this. Well, inherently chemical reactions are not 100% quantitative. There are competing side reactions that reduce your yield. Further, material is often lost during isolation. So the way us chemists sort of get a sense of the efficiency and throughput of a reaction is by looking at the percent yield, where percent yield is a measure of the amount of product obtained compared to the theoretical yield based on our limiting reagent. So percent yield is defined as the isolated yield over the theoretical yield times 100%. So to showcase percent yield calculations in their simplest form, so to showcase percent yield in their simplest form, if a reaction is expected to yield 200 milligrams of product and you isolate 100 milligrams, how would we calculate percent yield? Well, looking at our equation, percent yield is the isolated yield over the theoretical yield. So what is the isolated yield? In, what is the isolated yield in this case? What are you doing? Oh, oh uh, one moment. Uh, let me just mute a few things. Okay, perfect. Uh, could you repeat that, please? What is the isolated yield? 100 milligrams. Yep, exactly right. So we have an isolated yield of 100 milligrams. What is the theoretical yield? How much product are we expecting? 200 milligrams. Yep, 200 milligrams, exactly right. So punching this into our calculator, this gives us a percent yield of 50%. We isolated about half of the product that we expected to, assuming a 100% efficient reaction. Does this idea of percent yield make sense? It's just the isolated yield over the theoretical. Okay, so let's put this into practice on a more nuanced example. So in this case, we're given in this problem that aluminum and oxygen react to form aluminum oxide. And in this experiment, 75 grams of aluminum and 200 grams of oxygen generated 125 grams of aluminum oxide. So the amount that we isolate from the reaction is known as the isolated yield. Do we have a method to calculate the theoretical yield? Do we have a method to calculate the actual amount of aluminum oxide that we'd expect to make in this reaction under ideal conditions? Have we calculated theoretical yield throughout this chapter? Yes, we can do it with ICE. Yep, exactly right. So. Before we start accounting for the moles of each of our reactants, let's make sure we have a balanced equation. So aluminum is an atomic metal, oxygen is a diatomic gas and a nonmetal, and aluminum oxide, if we have Al3 plus O2 minus, we cross our charges and we get Al2O3. Now, now that we have this baseline chemical equation, my question to all of you is, what are the balanced reaction equation coefficients? How can we balance this equation? So let's spend about one to two minutes
trying to adjust our coefficients so that we get a balanced equation. So we see in the chat that we have the proposed coefficients, the proposed coefficients of four, three, and two. Perfect. Okay, so now that we have our coefficients set up, um, just to explain a little bit of the logic behind this, just to explain a little bit of the logic behind this process, if you use the, the cross method for oxygen, if you cross the subscript into the coefficient, that gives you your balanced equation coefficients for oxygen and aluminum oxide. And all you have to do is balance aluminum, which is easy since it's, a, it's an atomic metal. Okay, now that we have our balanced equation, Let's figure out and let's calculate the moles of aluminum and the moles of oxygen. So I'd like everyone to help me out and I'd like you to try to calculate the moles of aluminum and moles of oxygen over this next one to two minutes. And then we'll discuss and we'll talk about how to proceed through this next step. So let's try to calculate the initial moles of aluminum and the initial moles of oxygen. Let's try to get a few more responses in the chat and we'll discuss this portion in about another minute. You can also comment if you agree or disagree with the proposals in the chat. It's great to see consensus among the class in the chat. So to calculate the moles of aluminum, we're gonna go from the grams of aluminum to the moles of aluminum. One moment. So we're gonna go from the grams of aluminum to the moles of aluminum. So if we have Looking at our input, we have 75.0 grams of aluminum. And we know in one mole of aluminum, we have 27.0 grams. So punching that into our calculator, punching that into our calculator, we have 75 over 27. That gives us 2.78 moles of aluminum. For our moles of oxygen, we have 200.0 grams of oxygen. And we know that in one mole of oxygen, we have 32.0 grams. So 200 over 32 gives us 6.25 moles of oxygen. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to fill in 
In this case, since we need both the amount of product and the amount of excess reactant left over, the ice table method seems most appropriate. Okay, so now that we have that idea in mind, now that we see that we're likely going to have to use the ICE table method, let's fill in the data that we have so far. So initially we have 2.78 moles of aluminum and 6.25 moles of oxygen. Let's now fill in our change coefficients. So what would the change coefficient be for aluminum? If we have a reaction coefficient of four, what will our change coefficient be? 4x, yep. What would the change coefficient be for oxygen if our reaction coefficient is three? 3x, three yep. Okay, so then all we have to do now is solve for x for each of our reactants. So for aluminum, X is going to be equal to our initial moles divided by the reaction coefficient. So that gives us 0 0.695. For oxygen, X is equal to our initial moles over our reaction coefficient. and that gives us 2.08. So from this data, as we discussed, the limiting reactant is the smallest value of X. So which reactant is limiting? Which mm -hmm. reactant? Aluminum, exactly right. So aluminum is limiting. And as a result, we're going to plug in this value of X into our ICE table. Now, what's the change coefficient for aluminum oxide? Is it plus one, plus two, plus three? What's the change coefficient for aluminum oxide? 2X. 2X, exactly right. So we're going to plug in our value of x into each portion of our ice table. So as aluminum is limiting, we'll be left, be left with zero moles of aluminum at the end of our reaction. For the amount of oxygen left over, we have 4.165 moles of oxygen left over. For the moles of aluminum oxide produced, we have 1.39 moles of aluminum oxide. And now that we have the moles of each of our reactants and products, in order to estimate the theoretical yield, all we need to do is figure out the grams of aluminum oxide from the moles. So we're going to go from the moles of aluminum oxide to the grams of aluminum oxide. So if we have 1.39 moles of aluminum oxide, we know that our molar mass is 27 times 2 grams plus 16 times 3. This is the molar mass in one mole of aluminum oxide. So if we punch this into our calculator, we have 27 times 2 plus 16 times 3 times 1.39. That gives us a theoretical yield of 141.78 grams that we round to 142 grams. Now, if we if we just take a broader look and we try to think about, well, how does that fit into our problem? We know that we get an isolated yield. We know that our isolated yield 
is 125 grams. Well, this 142 grams is what's known as our theoretical yield. So do we have enough information to calculate the percent yield for this reaction? Yes. Yes, so we'll plug in our isolated yield, which is 125 grams over our theoretical yield, which is 142 grams. Note, both of these masses are for aluminum oxide. So punching that into our calculator, we get 125 over 142 times 100, and that gives us 88.0% for our yield, which is pretty good. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's pretty high for a combustion reaction. Does this percent yield calculation make sense? This is the only thing that we've added to our discussion. We just compare the amount that we actually isolate to the amount that we would expect to isolate. Professor, how do you get the 88.0 again? Ah, so we take the isolated yield, which is given in the problem as 125 grams, over the theoretical yield, which is how much product we would expect to see if all of our limiting reactant was completely consumed and we had a 100% efficient reaction. Does that make sense? But do you divide that and then multiply yes. yeah. that? Yep, so you take the isolated yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100. Okay, thank you. Does that address your question? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Perfect, sir. Yes. So in the um, like in the exam, you never ask us to calculate the isolated yield, right? We don't know how to do that. Oh, you 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 can't. The isolated yield is determined experimentally, and so essentially, the isolated yield is when you run the experiment in the lab. How much material do you actually get out at the end of the reaction? And that can never be calculated. It's only experimentally measured. Okay, so we don't have to be worried about like calculating. Yeah. The only thing that you're responsible for calculating given the initial quantities of each reactant is the theoretical yield. Okay, got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've seen one example of a percent yield problem. This is as difficult as it's going to get for this chapter. That's about as difficult of a question as I can ask in this chapter. One moment. So I'd like us now to try to tackle the following example. So we're given in the statement for our chemical reaction and chemical equation that hydrochloric acid is utilized to convert insoluble iron three oxide to iron three chloride, generating water as a byproduct. So we're, we're asked to calculate the expected mass of product that we'd expect to observe, as well as the percent yield if 20 grams of iron three chloride are isolated. Now, the first thing that we have to do is we have to get a balanced equation and we have to get the correct formulas for each of these species. So let's work on that for about two to three minutes. Let's try to get a balanced equation, or at least a skeletal equation with the correct formulas.
And it's great to see that we have some proposals for the formula. So we have hydrochloric acid as HCl, iron three oxide as Fe2O3, iron three chloride as FeCl3, and water as H2O. It's good to see that we have this preliminary unbalanced equation. Now let's focus on getting the correct balanced equation coefficients, and then we'll discuss this example once we see a few student proposals. We already see in the chat a proposal of six, one, two, and three for our balanced equation coefficients. So let's talk through the logic behind this problem. And let's talk through how we obtained our formulas it for this problem. So hydrochloric acid, we have H plus Cl minus, we cross our charges, HCl. Not too bad. Iron three oxide, we have Fe3 plus and O2 minus. We cross our charges, we get Fe2O3. Iron three chloride, we have Fe3 plus Cl minus, we cross our charges, we get FeCl3. Perfect. So now that we have our balanced equation, I'd like you to think a little bit carefully here about what method would get you to the final answer. So we know the initial amounts of each of our reactants. And the only thing we're being asked in this particular problem is to calculate the expected mass of product and the percent yield. So if we just need to know the, the mass of product generated, if we just need to know our theoretical yield of product, what method is most appropriate to calculate just the amount of product? I think the product method is better. Exactly, exactly. So the product method will likely save you some time. So in this case, you're going to, I'd like you to try to apply the product method so we're gonna go from the grams of iron three oxide to the moles of iron three oxide, to the moles of iron three chloride, to the grams of iron three chloride. And you're gonna repeat this conversion process. You're gonna repeat this conversion process for hydrochloric acid. So you're gonna go from the moles of hydrochloric acid to the moles of iron three chloride to the grams of iron three chloride. Of course, you're more than welcome to use the ICE table method as well. But if you just need to calculate the expected mass of product, then the product method is pretty efficient. And don't be shy to share your proposed, um, your proposed theoretical yield. And I'd like you to tell me from your calculations which reactant is limiting and what the actual theoretical yield is going to be. Remember, with the product method, you have to perform your calculations for each of your reactants.
So let's try to get some comments at, as you work through these calculations for the theoretical yield for this reaction using the product method. And let's try to get a few other proposals in the chat for the theoretical yield, and then we'll discuss this problem in about two to three minutes. And it's great to see that we're starting to see consensus across the class for the expected theoretical yield of product. And we'll discuss this example in about another minute. Let's try to get a few more responses from students and then we'll discuss the process for this problem. Okay, so let's talk about this example. Let's talk about this problem and let's work through it as a group. So first and foremost, in the product method, we know that we have 19 grams of iron three oxide. We know that in one mole of iron three oxide, what is the molar mass of iron? What is the molar mass of iron? Would anyone like to help me out in this step-by-step -step process? I got 55.85. Yep. And we have two iron atoms. And for oxygen, it's 16. And we have three oxygen atoms. OK, perfect. Now we need to consider our reaction stoichiometry. So how many moles of iron 3 chloride do we make? per mole of iron three oxide that we consume. What's our mole to mole ratio? Two to one. Two to one, exactly right. And for our molar mass of iron three chloride, we know that we have 55.85 grams of iron plus 35.45 grams of chlorine. And we have three chlorine atoms. So we have our molar masses. So if we punch this expression into our calculator, we end up with 19 divided by 55.85 times. So we have 55.85 times 2 plus 16 times 3. So this gives us a molar mass. So for iron three oxide as a molar mass of 
For iron three chloride, we have a molar mass of 162.2. So punching this into our calculator, we have 19 over 159.7 times two times 162.2. And that gives us an expected yield of 38.5 grams that we round to 39 grams of iron three chloride. Okay, let's look at what happens from hydrochloric acid because this problem currently isn't complete. We need to figure out the theoretical yield looking at both of our reactants. So then starting off, we're given that we have zero 0.6 moles of hydrochloric acid. Okay, so we don't even have to do that initial mass to mole conversion. Now, my question to everyone is, how many moles of iron three chloride do we make per mole of hydrochloric acid consumed? What's our mole to mole ratio? As we see from our coefficients, our mole to mole ratio is two to six. And then finally, just like before, we have 162.2 grams in one mole of iron three chloride. So if we punch this into our calculator, if we punch this into our calculator, we'll have 0 0.6 over three times 162.2. And that in turn gives us 32.4 grams of iron three chloride that we round to 30 grams of iron three chloride because this input only has one significant figure. So the responses that I saw in the chat were exactly right. Does this question make sense to everyone? Does this question make sense to everyone? so far? Any questions on this product method calculation so far? Oops, Professor, one. can you um, go over real quick? I know you were saying because of the sig figs um, where we got the 30 grams. Can you just explain that a little bit more? Yes, Thank yes. You. Thank One you. moment, let me just pan back to that. One moment, give me a second to get us back to the same location on the screen. Oops. Ah, I see the issue. Okay. One moment. Let me get us back to the page that we were at previously. So just to talk a little bit about how the product method works. The limiting reactant is the reactant that when completely consumed generates the least amount of product. And as we notice, we can clearly see that hydrochloric acid is limiting because hydrochloric acid generated the least amount of product. And we can only generate as much product as we would get if we completely consumed our limiting reactant. Now, the reason why our final answer has one sig fig is that our input only has one sig fig. So we'd have to round 32.4 to one sig fig, which would give us just 30. Does that idea make sense to everyone? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Did that answer the question in the chat about how we identify the limiting reactant and how we identify our theoretical yield? Yeah. Perfect. So. But 
I have a question regarding what, when you put it into the yield part, are you going off the 30 or are you going off of you'll, before you'll you go round it? 30, you'll go off the 32.4, but okay. we note a bar to signify with this bar that only the first digit is significant. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at our we're going to take a look at our isolated yield. So we isolated in this problem. Sorry about that. Sometimes there's a small delay when I resize the screen over the Zoom call. So there we go. So we see that we isolated 20 grams of iron. So then for our percent yield, for our percent yield, Let's perform and let's complete our percent yield calculations. So for our percent yield, we're gonna take our isolated yield, which is 20 grams over our theoretical yield, which is 32.4 grams times 100%. So punching this into our calculator. We have 20 over 32.4 times 100%. That in turn gives us 61.7% that we round to one sig fig, which gives us a yield of 60% for our percent yield. Does that make sense to everyone? Zero. Sorry, what was that? I thought when it asked for the 20, like it, it said 20.0 for the ah, sure. yeah. yield. Yep. Yep. And so even though our top number has three sig figs, our bottom number with one functional sig fig limits the amount of significant figures we can report in our final answer. Got it. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Okay, so let's keep going now. We're almost finished with this chapter. I know it's been a long chapter, but it really sets the stage for a lot of the foundational concepts and skills that you'll need. And if you can do mass to mole conversions, then dealing with the chapter on solutions is gonna be quite straightforward. So that was the last example I have planned for this chapter. Looking at our time remaining, we don't quite have enough time to start our next chapter on solutions in enough depth for us to begin to establish some foundations. So what we're going to do is this is a good stopping point for today's lecture, but we're going to talk a little bit about solution behavior, solution properties, and common definitions in the laboratory today. So we'll take a quick break and we'll meet as a class at 12 o'clock for laboratory.